Tonight's state of emergency, the troubling new images near Yellowstone National Park, a bridge swallowed by a raging river, an entire home collapsing into the water. And in Chicago, near hurricane force winds ripping the roof off an apartment building. Travelers sheltering in place at O'Hare Airport, plus several wildfires still burning out in the west. One in northern Arizona now charring more than 20,000 acres. And a deadly heat wave continues with temperatures hovering in the triple digits. Also tonight, the Fed versus Wall Street, the country bracing for possibly the largest interest rate hike in nearly 30 years as the Federal Reserve tries to curb inflation. Credit cards, car loans, and mortgages likely impacted, and stocks tumbling yet again. But it comes as Americans face another rise in prices, and at least 21 states plus D.C. see gas at $5 a gallon. President Biden hoping to bring gas prices down with a trip to Saudi Arabia, but the schedule July visit comes just a few years after Biden called the country a quote pariah state for the brutal murder of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The president says he will press the kingdom on human rights violations. But how far will he really go as the U.S. grows more desperate for oil? Brittany Griner's detention extended. The WNBA star ordered to stay in a Russian jail until at least July 2nd. Her team meeting with the U.S. State Department. Are they any closer to bringing her home? The field day collapsed back here. The shocking moment in an inflatable slide tipped over at a Long Island park. At least 14 children sent flying towards the ground. The investigation tonight into what happened. And call of the wild, the dog ending up in a gorilla enclosure, coming face to face with at least two confused apes. The effort to get him out as one of the gorillas closed in. Top story starts right now. And good evening. Devastating flooding, deadly heat and wildfires. That's just some of the extreme weather sweeping the country at this hour and more is on the way. Horrified eyewitnesses capturing the moment a bridge was swept away by the Yellowstone River. Historic flooding also taking out a large waterfront home. You see it right there. 85 mile per hour winds tearing through Chicago, ripping parts of a roof off a three story apartment building. And this storm also ripping up trees, branches, and piercing through rooftops. Tens of thousands of people still without power tonight. And new video also showing a lightning strike hitting Cincinnati as those storms rolled through the Midwest. Flooding also causing a tragedy in Milwaukee, where two adults and a child were swept into a drainage ditch. And in the West, a state of emergency in Arizona as a wildfire explodes in size. More than 20,000 acres burned. Firefighters there still unable to contain it. There's also concern tonight over the power grid in Texas as that extreme heat grips the country. Morgan Chesky will have the latest from Dallas in just a few minutes, but we begin tonight with Gotti Schwartz, who leads us off from Los Angeles. Tonight, weather extremes as destructive as they are contradictory. In the West, fires, historic flooding, and extreme drought all at the same time. The latest epicenter for devastation, Yellowstone National Park, an icon of Mother Nature. Parts now underwater with unprecedented flash flooding just as the busy summer tourist season begins. Onlookers watching helplessly as this two-story home was swallowed by the Yellowstone River. The level so high and the current so strong. Holy this bridge was also swept away by raging waters. The floods stemming from a thousand mile long atmospheric river that pounded Washington, Montana and Wyoming, dumping massive amounts of rain. That along with rapidly melting snowpack, making roads completely impassable. In our basement and there's about two feet in the covering the entire street in front of our house, just you know, rolling as fast as the river is. CNBC's Valerie Castro is in Livingston, Montana. As you can see, some homes here in Livingston have already flooded. The local hospital, which was evacuated, remains under several feet of water, and now the winds are yet another force to deal with as the cleanup process begins. But the rain did little for fires threatening communities in California, a situation made even more dangerous by the mega drought stretching across the West. This is record-breaking temperatures span much of the country. More than 100 million are under heat alerts. In several cities, the heat index will top more than 100 degrees today. Meanwhile, other parts of the country are bracing for severe storms that yesterday tore through the Midwest. The whole roof fell down. At Chicago's O'Hare, travelers were told to seek shelter. They moved us all away from the windows. As near hurricane force winds toppled trees and ripped apart homes. 
All right, Gotti joins us now from Los Angeles. It has been dangerous out there for so many parts of the country. Gotti, I want to go back to what was happening in Yellowstone. Do we have a clearer picture of what's happening there tonight? Uh, well, Tom, uh, officials in the park just uh, had an update, and they uh, told us that the, about 10 thousand visitors were inside of Yellowstone when all this was happening. They were able to manage uh, manage to get all 10,000 of those visitors out with the exception of one group uh, that was in the back country, but they don't think that there are any any imminent harm. Now uh, that house that you're seeing, I, I do want to say uh, that that house uh, dropped into the river there and we now understand that it went down the river floating for about five miles before it finally sunk into the Yellowstone River. Incredible. I know we have a team uh, from NBC News headed over there to cover this a little more in depthly. All right, we, we appreciate that, Gotti. We're also watching the brutal heat wave in Texas with soaring energy demand causing new concerns about the power grid, which suffered a catastrophic failure last year. Here's Morgan Chesky. Mid-June in Texas and dangerous heat already turning historic. Austin topping 100 degrees for eight straight days. Dallas hitting 103 Saturday, tying a daily high from 1911. Sweltering temps forcing skyrocketing energy demand. Matthew Browning, one of thousands in North Texas who lost power over the weekend when his supplier admitted record breaking heat stressed equipment. And when we're eventually getting into those triple digits consistently, you know, it's concerning. The loss of power from heat reminding many of brutal cold. Every source of power that the state of Texas has has been compromised. The Texas freeze in February of 2021 left millions in the dark and cold when the state power grid couldn't keep up. ERCOT, the agency managing the state's now highly scrutinized grid, said it's now performing as needed. Adding Sunday's demand set a new all-time peak. It's a very delicate balance to strike here. Michelle Richman, who represents a trade group of Texas power generators, says extreme weather, like heat waves starting earlier in the year, shortens vital maintenance windows known as shoulder seasons. We need to be able to take our maintenance outages in order to make sure we can run when Texans really need us. It's a problem Texas witnessed in mid-May when ERCON asked at least one plant to postpone planned maintenance to help meet demand. The very next day, the plant went offline due to equipment failure. And tonight, it's not power lines, but a busted water pipe creating a scary situation in the West Texas city of Odessa, Texas, where officials say they could be without water due to that busted main for up to 48 hours. And the temperature there right now, 100 degrees, that high heat expected throughout the remainder of this week. Tom? All that heat and no water. Unbelievable. All right, Morgan, we thank you for that. For more on all this extreme weather we're tracking, I want to bring in Bill Karen tonight with the forecast. So, Bill, walk us through what we're looking at tonight. Yeah, and after seeing all that, we have to say, climate change makes all these events a little bit worse. The drought in the West, even the flooding in areas of Yellowstone, with all those dramatic pictures that we saw, we can get rainfall rates that are higher than they should be because of climate change. And the heat waves, we're going to get more of them in the longer duration. So the one we're in right now is going to linger. And this one's going to not going to slowly drift off as we towards the weekend, but we still have 95 million Americans that are under heat warnings or heat advisories. The worst of it today was in areas of the Midwest from St. Louis, where you broke your record high for the second day in a row. Also in Chicago, Midway, you hit at 100 degrees. The first time you've done that in over a decade. And this is the current heat index. This is how it feels in the shade right now from Chicago, 103, St. Louis, 103, Shreveport, 103. It was very hot in the Carolinas, but thankfully, and even Georgia, some thunderstorms did cool you off. Tomorrow, near record highs once again from Texas all the way to the Ohio Valley. And we're going to continue with the heat all the way back into Thursday. Dallas once again near more record highs. So, Bill, I know we're so focused on what's happening throughout the country, but a little further down south, we're also watching something in the tropics. Yeah, we could actually see our next you know, B name storm, which would be Bonnie. But first, we have to worry about severe weather. And then we're going to worry about what's going to happen maybe in the tropics as we head towards the next couple days. So, for tomorrow, severe weather threat in the southeast again, Alabama to Georgia. But watch out, our friends in Wisconsin could see some very strong storms there, maybe even some more damaging winds, kind of similar to the event we had the other night. And then by the time we get to Thursday, more severe weather in areas from Pennsylvania to New York. And as far as the tropics go, the Hurricane Center is now tropping our next tropical area of possibility. That's off the coast of Nicaragua and Honduras. And this one could head up towards Mexico and Cancun as we go throughout the next couple days.
All right, Bill, we thank you for that. Next tonight, with skyrocket inflation and fears of a looming recession, all eyes are on the Federal Reserve as it weighs the largest rate hike in nearly 30 years. The S&P fell for a fifth straight day, while the national average for a gallon of gas continues to climb. And new mortgage data shows the 30-year fixed mortgage rate rose to 6.28% this week, a headline from CNBC right there as well. This is President Biden says he's doing everything he can to bring down prices while blaming Putin for the rising prices that are happening. NBC's Tom Costello has more. Amid skyrocketing inflation and with polls showing most Americans disapprove of his handling of the economy, President Biden today pointed to his own successes. We've created 8.7 million new jobs in 16 months, an all-time record. While again blaming the exploding prices on Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine. Just since he invaded Ukraine, it's gone up a dollar seventy-four a gallon because of nothing else but that. But inflation was running hot well before Russia invaded, fueled in part by the supply chain crisis and massive pandemic stimulus spending. Today, more evidence that inflation is not cooling. The producer price index, a gauge of wholesale prices, up nearly 11 percent in one year. Drivers in 21 states plus D.C. are now paying more than $5 a gallon for gas, a record. Everyone's headed up to here. Really. In Utah, single mom Jamie Martinez is struggling to pay for food, gas, and rent jumping $400. Rent is going to just continue increasing, and who knows when it's going to be a point where I'm like, okay, I can't afford this anymore. Where am I supposed to live? After already raising interest rates twice this year, the Federal Reserve is expected to hike rates tomorrow by the most since 1994, three quarters of a percentage point. What's the risk that the Fed slams on the brake too hard and pushes the economy into recession? There's a definite risk that the Fed will raise rates both too quickly and too far. We've never really come out of a pandemic before like this, so we don't know how much underlying momentum there is to the economy. But higher rates mean Americans pay more for credit cards, new car loans, and mortgages. A new $400,000 mortgage on January 1st costs $1,745 a month. After two rate hikes this year, that payment is now $589 more, likely to go up with higher rates to come. All right, and with that, Tom Costello joins us now. Tom, it seems like every day when we talk to you, there are more and more troubling signs of this yeah. economy and a possible slowdown, and that may be very confusing to people. Yeah, you know, economists are confused by this economy because you've got uh, nearly 50-year low unemployment, 3.6 percent. That's really, really low. You've still got pretty strong consumer spending. Inflation, very strong, 40-year highs. They're trying to raise interest rates to bring down inflation. But as I mentioned, the consumer still is very strong out there despite $5 gas. By the way, 30-year uh, mortgage rates right now are at 6.25 percent. That's up. Uh, three percentage points just from January. So there's a lot going on here. That said, you know, the bond market is pricing in the possibility of recession as soon as next year. And this latest gauge of optimism on the economy right now is at a, is at a record low going forward. Tom Costello with a broad look at everything we're facing. Tom, we thank you for that. I want to head to the NASDAQ now and bring in our friend CNBC anchor Brian Sullivan to kind of dig a little bit more into these numbers. Brian, as Tom mentioned earlier, all eyes are on that Fed meeting tomorrow and new numbers show that the average mortgage rate is up to 6.28 percent. I think that's right this week, up from 5.5 percent just a week ago. On top of that, Redfin and Compass announced major layoffs today as home sales slow down. So, Brian, give us the state of the economy right now when it comes to the housing market. Well, the housing market is definitely showing some cracks, Tom. I mean, it is a scary time because we talk a lot about the stock market on CNBC. The housing market is far bigger. It is far more important, not only for the overall economy, of course, but for individual families. Mortgage rates going up is a net negative for housing in so many ways. You have to consider that about 90 percent of mortgages are under 5 percent and about 50 percent are under 4 percent. I bring that up, Tom, because as rates rise and maybe you've got a family that's considering moving but doesn't have to, they're going to take a look and say, yeah, we got a 4 percent mortgage right now. The new house is going to be maybe two, two and a half percent higher than that. We just can't afford it unless those home prices come down. It is a big deal what is happening in the housing market right now. 
it is something to watch. Not as bad as 2008, Tom, but certainly showing some cracks. Yeah, Brian, also, you know, we've been focusing so much on record high gas prices, which President Biden is hoping to address in his trip to Saudi Arabia. We're going to have more on that in just a moment. We're going to talk to Peter Alexander in the White House, but that's still a month away. The Department of Energy just announced its fourth sale of oil from the strategic reserves to try to bring down those record gas prices. Mm. But will we actually feel any relief at the pump, especially this summer? No. No, I mean, remember, the SPR, Strategic Petroleum Reserve, is not designed to combat prices. It's designed to have oil in case there's a hurricane or some other natural occurrence or an emergency that wipes out oil supplies. The SPR has to be refilled legally. So we're selling some now. We're going to have to buy that same oil back in the future, which could then elevate prices. People, even with high gas prices, Tom, they are still driving. They are still flying, at least for now. Now, you can say that oil prices maybe would be be higher, but for the release from the SPR, so as bad as it is, it could have potentially been worse. Listen, he can go to Saudi Arabia and talk to the Saudis about more oil. They're going to probably say they do not have a lot of spare capacity. They might be able to raise output a little bit, but maybe not by enough to counter global demand, particularly as China hopefully comes out of COVID. Their economy could start consuming a lot more oil. Oil truly is, Tom, a globally priced commodity. Right. And so we have high gas prices. We have groceries that are expensive. And now we're learning that electricity prices are also skyrocketing. I know places like New Jersey, in some some cities, it's up 50%. It's getting expensive to keep the lights on there at the CNBC World Headquarters. So what should people be worried about? And, and, and are blackouts this summer a, a real concern? They are a real concern, and right now what's happening in much of America, particularly in the Midwest, from Chicago all the way down to Louisiana, is a massive heat wave. You've got temperatures over 100 degrees. The demand for power, air conditioning, is absolutely off the charts. I'll give you an example. Today, you had energy costs going for about $138 per megawatt hour at the utility level. Your viewers say, what does that mean? Well, last June, they were $33. Now, they fluctuate every minute, so that could come down. But the point right now, Tom, has gone from 33 to 138 in a year. Not all of it, but a lot of that is going to be passed on to consumers, maybe in 30, 40, 50 percent increases if you're not on a fixed rate plan. The point is right now, you got inflation on the gas side. You've got inflation on the mortgage and interest rate side. And now you've got this electricity inflation. And as temperatures rise, I think no doubt the political temperature is going to rise as well because inflation is hitting every aspect of the American family. CNBC's Brian Sullivan for us. We thank Brian for that. And as Brian mentioned, there's a political side to all of this. The White House announcing President Biden will travel to Saudi Arabia next month, with many speculating he'll ask the oil-rich nation to ramp up fuel production to ease skyrocketing gas prices here at home. Also on the itinerary, a meeting with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The visit, a sign of the harsh realities the president is facing and the shifts in policy it's forcing him to consider. Big oil companies and the Saudi government, two things then candidate Biden railed against during his 2019 campaign. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, we're going to end fossil fuel and I am not going to cooperate with him, okay? Khashoggi was in fact murdered and dismembered and I believe in the order of the crown prince. And I would make it very clear, we were not going to, in fact, sell more weapons to them. We were going to, in fact, make them pay the price and make them, in fact, the pariah that they are. There's very little social redeeming value of the, in the present uh, government in Saudi Arabia. All right, President Biden there as a candidate talking about Jamal Khashoggi and his murder by Saudi Arabia. Of course, I want to get to NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander. So, Peter, we, we hear those the president's words during the campaign years ago, but this trip seems to be sending a very different message. How is the White House explaining this reversal? Yeah, Tom, the White House has been pressed on this question. The fact is, you note that he's breaking this campaign pledge to make Saudi Arabia, in his words, a pariah over its human rights record. His press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, today saying that President Biden plans to raise human rights concerns uh, when he meets with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the very person U.S. intelligence believes ordered Jamal Khashoggi's murder. But they didn't. The press secretary did not directly answer whether the president would bring up the journalist's killing. Of course, with gas prices soaring all-time highs, though, here in, in part due to the U.S.'s ban on Russian oil exports, the president heads on this trip to the Middle East, his first time there, next month hoping to repair relations the bottom line the white house denies that this visit will primarily focus 
on getting the Saudis to pump more oil, but U.S. officials do acknowledge that oil is a key factor, Tom. So, Peter, do we also know why there seemed to be sort of a mixed message from the White House on whether this trip would or would not happen? It seemed like every day there was a different answer or a different explanation of what was happening. Yeah, I think they recognize that there are, there are some political challenges here. Obviously, the president in the past said that he'd treat them like a pariah. Now he's going. Republicans have criticized him for this. Today, the press secretary emphasized that when the U.S. sort of recalibrates relationships, as they say is happening here, it's not looking to rupture relationships. Obviously, some may be skeptical about how hard the president's going to press uh, these human rights issues. But a, a top Republican today did complain about the president making this trip, basically, in his words, going hat in hand to the Saudis to try to get them to, uh, to increase energy production, insisting that President Biden should be doing more at home to boost oil production here. Tom. Peter, we thank you for that. We're sticking with politics now. We head down to South Carolina. Voters are heading to the polls and casting their ballot in the midterm primary contests. And like so many other states, these races are revealing a divide in the Republican Party. As voters decide whether to back President Trump's picks or his political enemies. NBC's Vaughn Hilliard is on the ground for us tonight in South Carolina. Donald Trump's revenge tour hitting South Carolina today. What made you not like Nancy Mace? She, I felt like she betrayed both the people, her constituents, and President Trump. Two incumbent Republican members of Congress drawing Trump's anger last year. And now, an effort to oust them from office. Unfortunately for the patriots of South Carolina, you currently have two atrocious rhinos. They're bad people in the House. Tom Rice voted to impeach Donald Trump after the insurrection, telling us this spring... He's probably the most uh, spiteful, vengeful person I've ever met. How you doing? But despite Trump endorsing his opponent, he has remained steadfast in his denunciation trying to sell Republican voters on his posture. I think I'm just telling the truth. You know, the, the truth will set you free. And uh, I, think, I, I, I think that Donald Trump is not the future of the Republican Party. And now we're heading three hours south of here, where Nancy Mace has taken a different approach to Trump. Mace's condemnation of Trump last year, explicit. We were really trying hard to figure out how do we how do we hold a president accountable that put all of our lives at risk. But now Trump backing an opposing candidate in an effort to purge her from Congress. And Mace is striking a different tenor. I'm in front of Trump Tower today. I was one of his earliest supporters. Do you think Donald Trump should be a leader in this Republican Party going forward? Well, he can. He is welcome to lead whomever he wants in it within our party. We have a big party, a big ten party. To what extent did Trump's endorsement impact your decision in this race? None. 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 You voted for? I voted for Nancy. Mace has always been one of my favorites. But you didn't vote for her. <laughs> no. You voted for Arrington. Did Trump have something to do with that? A little bit. <laughs> A little bit. In the shadows of the January 6th committee hearings, primary day here is a chance for Republican voters to chart their party's path ahead. All right, Vaughn Hilliard joins us now live from Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Vaughn, I, I sort of want to take a bigger uh, picture approach to this. You've been traveling the country for us, covering a lot of these Republican primaries and these races. What, what's your sense? We just heard there a voter say that, that President Trump's endorsement didn't, didn't really mean anything. Are you hearing more of that or less of that? You know, it's a good question, Tom, because there was one gentleman there that we talked to who said that he had no influence and no ability to change his vote in this race. At the same time, you're seeing so few other Republicans step up and attempt to be leaders in this Republican Party who are not Donald Trump. And that is where, when you are looking at across the country, you folks are seeing Liz Cheney there at the helm of the January 6th Select Committee. But there's not many other Republicans, national Republicans, who have taken the step of speaking out directly uh, against Donald Trump, like Tom Rice here. And that is when it comes to a voter level here. They're continually hearing their party uh, stand by the former president. And those voters that we are talking to, they're hesitant to speak out. Several of them saying that they don't want to talk to us on camera there because they know they're in their community that Donald Trump's support here is so strong. But if Tom Rice and Nancy Mace are able to pull it off, it may send a signal to other Republicans that they could step forward and go without Donald Trump's support and ultimately pull off re-election bids. Yeah, no, no doubt interesting uh, races to watch. All right, uh, we thank you for that, Vaughn. As always, we turn now to the latest on WNBA star Brittany Griner, who's been detained in Russia since February. Local reports now saying her detention 
has just been extended again as her team back in the States continues to fight for her release. NBC's Stephen Romo has more. Tonight, more time behind bars in Russia for WNBA star Brittany Griner. Russian state media announcing her detention that started almost four months ago has been extended yet again. You know, BG to come home safe as soon as possible is number one on our list. The news comes just a day after Griner's teammates met with the State Department about her situation. And knowing that the State Department and, you know, pretty much the whole world is on this, I think gives us a lot of confidence knowing that they're working on it. Griner was arrested back in February by Russian customs officials at an airport near Moscow when she was allegedly caught with a vape cartridge containing hash oil, according to Russian authorities. She says she's innocent. The Russian government has extended Griner's detention repeatedly and now says she'll be imprisoned through at least July 2nd. There have been few sightings of Griner since she was detained. Last month, she was spotted on Russian state TV in handcuffs, leaving a courthouse. Family, friends, and fellow players have shown their support, including NBA stars. It's a huge part of the community here. I mean, we all support her. Just want to try to get her home as soon as possible. The WNBA adding her initials and number 42 on their courts. Her friend and former coach Don Staley telling us about Griner's strength after the last extension. Is it a dire situation? Absolutely, it is. But you know, Brittany's tough. She's tough minded. She's, she's tough hearted. You know, basketball gives you a certain type of strength to endure pretty much everything. In May, the State Department reclassified Griner as wrongfully detained, meaning the U.S. government would seek to negotiate her return. Uh, Brittany Griner should not be detained. Uh, she, she should not be detained for a single day longer. Former diplomat Bill Richardson, who has helped free numerous Americans from around the world, was also asked to help by Griner's wife. I had a lot of relationships with uh, Russian government officials mm -hmm. on energy, on foreign policy, on U.N. issues. So uh, they know me. Uh, I know them. Griner's teammates saying they remain hopeful despite the new delay in getting her home. Now we're here to do whatever we can to, to make sure we amplify and uh, keep BG at the forefront of the things that we want to do. All right, Stephen joins us now. And Stephen, Trevor Reed, the American who was held in Russia for nearly three years, has just filed a petition. Yeah, he's filed that petition with the U.N., basically saying that until the world and the U.N. holds Russia accountable for these um, unlawful detainees, that they're just going to keep on doing this and holding people like Brittany Griner. All right, we're back now with Top Stories news feed, and we begin with a deadly crash on a Wisconsin highway. Cell phone video shows the fiery scene near Milwaukee. You see it right here. Police say a semi-truck pulling a flatbed trailer crossed a median, colliding head-on with a tanker truck. One of the trucks burst into flames and another flipped over. Authorities say multiple people are dead. The investigation tonight after an inflatable slide collapsed during a field day event on New York's Long Island. A surveillance camera capturing the moment the slide tipped over at a park in Wyandanche. At least 14 six and seven year olds on it at the time sent crashing onto the tennis court. Several children injured, including one with a broken leg. Officials are now looking into exactly how this happened. And a warning tonight over a popular Fisher Price product after more than a dozen child deaths. The Consumer Product Safety Commission issuing a safety notice for the company's infant to toddler and newborn to toddler rockers. The agency says the products should never be used for sleep and children should never be unsupervised or unrestrained near them. Since 2009, there have been at least 13 reported deaths linked to improper use of these rockers. And next tonight to an ongoing investigation on Capitol Hill. Billions of dollars of COVID relief funds have been allocated over the last two years, but just who did that money go to and how much did certain people profit? One company allegedly pocketing millions of taxpayer dollars. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has more. This nondescript office building in Virginia housed a company the feds hired to help distribute billions of dollars in loans to help struggling small businesses during the pandemic. The firm, RER Solutions, got a no-bid $750 million contract. The company netted $340 million in windfall profits, despite assigning the work to just six of its employees, according to a U.S. House subcommittee report released today. Why do you think the COVID spending at that time was so out of control. Because we did not have effective 
uh, enforcement of the oversight procedures that Congress put in place. The Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, known as EIDL, has previously been under scrutiny, as the Justice Department's Inspector General told Lester. The Small Business Administration, in sending that money out, largely relied on an honor system. Prosecutors had already accused some borrowers of using the money to buy luxury homes, cryptocurrency, and Teslas. Now, investigators are looking closer at companies that distributed the money amid revelations that as much as 20% of the funds may have been awarded to fraudsters. Each dollar stolen was a dollar taken from a small restaurant owner who wanted nothing more than to keep her staff on the payroll. RER Solutions told congressional investigators it subcontracted part of the work out to two other companies. The firm, which has not been charged with any crime or misconduct, did not respond to NBC News's repeated request for comment. The company was taking advantage of the law that existed. All right, NBC national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us now on set. So, Gabe, you know, this story had to do with one company, but you were just telling me this could be the tip of the iceberg? Yeah, that's right, Tom. Congressional investigators say that there are more than 1,100 ongoing investigations into pandemic-related small business loans, and there's a lot of blame to go around. The Democrats are blaming the Trump administration for not having the safeguards in place. But Republicans say that there were a lot of successes in these programs, and they want Democrats to focus more on the unemployment insurance program, and they say that those programs may have had a lot of alleged fraud. All right, Gabe, we thank you for that. Now to Top Stories Global Watch, the new cyberbullying law just passed in Japan. This is really interesting. Japan's parliament now making online insults punishable by up to one year in prison. Offenders would also face a 300,000 yen fine, about $2,200 here in America. The new legislation gained prominence after Japanese reality TV star Hana Kim... Kimura died by suicide in 2020 after facing social media abuse. And Nicaragua is expanding military ties with Russia, which could further strain U.S. relations with the Central American country. Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega has authorized Russian troops, planes and ships to deploy to the country. Officials say it's for purposes of training law enforcement and emergency response. Russia calling the move, quote, routine. All right, and with that, we want to turn now to the Americas. Tonight, growing fears in El Salvador is the value of Bitcoin plummets. Last year, the country declared the cryptocurrency legal tender alongside the U.S. dollar and invested in it. But now the recent crash has wiped much of that value away. Yet as concerns mount, the nation could default. El Salvador's leaders say they aren't worried. Here's NBC's George Solis. It was the Bitcoin bash heard round the world. El Salvador hailed Bitcoin as its future. It's the evolution of humankind. So we're going there. Last year, the country's president, Nayib Bukele, declared the cryptocurrency legal tender and promised to reimagine his country around the cash you can't hold. We had some attacks of the opposition. Believe it or not, we have an opposition. The government investing some 105 million taxpayer dollars. But tonight, as crypto crashes, the Central American country's investment is now worth roughly half what it paid, losing some $40 million in value. President Nayib Bukele has really tethered his political fate to this nationwide crypto experiment, so he's going to try to do whatever he can to make this work. Yet, as the value fell, Bukele continued to invest, engaging in a practice known as buying the dip, buying more crypto as the price dropped. Financial experts say the International Monetary Fund's relationship with El Salvador soured after they warned them to ditch Bitcoin. As a result, the country losing out on a $1.3 billion bailout. Is this country going to default? I mean, that's a question that everybody has right now. They really needed that loan from the IMF. The IMF is not playing ball because they think that this Bitcoin experiment is a bad idea. This week, El Salvador's finance minister dismissed concerns over the crash. In a televised press conference, he said the nation has not lost going all in on Bitcoin. As of Tuesday, a single Bitcoin is worth around 22,000 U.S. dollars. The country owns more than 2,300 units. Uh, Bitcoin? No. no. Okay. On the streets of El Salvador. Every single store that we've asked, uh, no one's accepting Bitcoin. The crypto market's scarce, with many vendors steering clear. In April, NBC's Gotti Schwartz documented the challenges, finding confused customers, vendors, and glitchy transactions. I still have zero money in this account. 
but occasional success. Oh, there we go. Okay, this is, yeah. this is the best transaction we've had so far. Despite all this, Bukele doubled down last November, announcing a proposed city in the southern coast of the country, funded by Bitcoin and powered by a volcano, to be known as Bitcoin City. And it's going to include everything, residential areas, commercial areas, services, museums, entertainment, bars, restaurants. The question now is whether this modeled city of gold gleams bright or darkens El Salvador's financial future. All right, George Solis joins us now live from Los Angeles. So, George, as you mentioned the piece there we saw with Gotti, there are still a lot of questions whether crypto industry trickled down to business owners in El Salvador. For those who did introduce Bitcoin to their businesses, what, what are they saying now given the recent dip in the market? Yeah, Tom, it's a wait and see game at the moment. The country has seen a slow adoption of Bitcoin. Now, residents were given 30 bucks in Bitcoin by the government as an incentive to use it. And once they spent that, many didn't want to buy more. Now, as for the loss, because the government hasn't cashed out its Bitcoin, it technically hasn't lost money yet. But financial experts say it's a situation that could become dire for the cash-strapped nation. Tom? All right, George, we appreciate that. Thank you. Coming up, the end of an era, superstar K-pop group BTS tearfully announcing a hiatus and that they're moving on to solo projects. So is this a permanent split of one of the world's largest pop groups? We'll break it down after this break. Stay with us. All right, I want to bring in now Deputy Music Editor at Variety, Jem Aswad, to talk to us about this moment. So, Jem, you know, a lot of people may be watching our show. We're, we're a pretty serious news show. But talk to our viewers on why this is such a moment. How big is BTS across the world? Well, a group called the IFPI, an organization called that, said they were the biggest group in the entire world. Um, their reach is on all continents. They have the most dedicated fan base I think I've ever seen. And they've sold tons of records. Now, and we're talking about fan levels, like, at the Beatles level, like, like dedicated, dedicated fans. Absolutely. And the community is a big part of it. Like, one of the times I saw them, I went around and I interviewed people um, in the audience, and every single one of them said that the friends that they made as part of that community are the biggest, are the best friends they've made in their lives. So, so do we know why they're breaking up now at sort of the peak and the height of their success? Um, it's been nine years. That's quite a while to be around the same people, <laughs> um, you know, and to the degree that they are. And um, there's not really a whole lot left for them to achieve, and maybe they want to try some solo projects or whatever. They're also getting a bit older, and they're going where all boy bands go, on hiatus. So, I mean, we talk about some, you know, very well-known boy bands breaking up. You think of One Direction. You can go way back, New Kids on the Block, Backstreet Boys. Where do you put BTS along with these other groups. Oh, completely alongside them. You know, yeah. if the numbers aren't quite as big, it's because it's a different era. And another sort of unwritten rule is the fact that you never say you're breaking up. You're going on hiatus. Uh, that leaves your options open, and it prevents the fans from freaking out, and it gives the solo efforts a chance. Um, and if they don't work, they can get back together. They recently collaborated with Coldplay. That song, My Universe, was a huge success, especially here in the United States. Do you think they will have sort of that international acclaim as solo artists, too? Because I know not all of them speak, you know, various languages. I know only I think a couple or one of them speaks fluent English. Well, it, it depends, you know. It, yeah. Some of them will, some of them won't. You know, that's the way it works with all of them. Look at One Direction. Harry yeah. Styles' career is a lot bigger than the others, but that's no diss to the others who are also doing fine. Yeah. Um, were BTS fans hoping for more albums? Do we think like a reunion tour, a reunion album will be down down the line in the works? What do you think? Oh, almost, almost unquestionably. But yeah. the thing is, it's so hard to be a boy band when you're in your 40s. So, yeah. you know, it's a question right. of when it comes around again. I, I don't know if you've had a chance to speak to any BTS fans. How did the fans react to, to this announcement? Oh, disaster. Absolute yeah. disaster. But, you know, along with that, you get seven solo records. And they insisted they're not breaking up. It's just a hiatus. Okay. We, uh, we appreciate that. Uh, Gemma Aswad from Variety, thank you so much for talking about the impact of BTS, and we'll see what's next for them. All right, when we come back, Call of the Wild, the dog getting into a gorilla enclosure in San Diego, even chased by one of the apes, more on this tense scene and how it all ended. Next, stay with us. Finally tonight, a dog's wild encounter, a stray wandering into the gorilla habitat at San Diego Zoo Safari Park. The gorilla's reaction, the breathless onlookers watching in fear, and the rescue efforts by the local Humane Society all caught on camera. At the San Diego Zoo Safari Park, visitors looking to watch the gorillas notice something a little strange. Oh my God. 
a wild encounter National Geographic never saw coming. A stray dog and a pair of gorillas coming face to face. The stray somehow made it into the enclosure. The gorillas not too happy about the new guy on their turf. Hey, the dog coming down here, guys. Hurry, come on. Anxious onlookers tried to coax the pup out of the enclosure. The steps come right on, here. Come upstairs. Puppy. Doggy, the stairs. Park visitors, even a zoo worker, all seeming to work with the gorilla to get the dog to safety. Oh, there he goes. He just went down. That's when officers from the San Diego Humane Society stepped up to help out the scared dog. So when we arrived, the zoo keepers uh, at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park had recalled the gorillas from the exhibit back into a separate enclosure. Oh, it's okay, buddy. Our job was to come in and secure the dog, um, who at that point was safe and was not under threat from the gorillas. I think he was he was happy to be safe and secure at that point. Humane Society officers escorting the dog out of the zoo and naming him Mighty Joe Young after Hollywood's second most famous gorilla. Back in San Diego, everyone asking, how did this happen? The dog, you know, ended up in a place that he maybe didn't intend, but we're happy that he was not injured. He's not microchipped, so the Humane Society is hoping his rightful owner will come forward. This dog is a brave one. He entered the wild, ran with the gorillas, and lived to tell the story. He's a, an incredibly sweet dog, just, just an awesome dog. All right, we hope Mighty Joe Young finds a home of his own very soon. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.